السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي All praise belongs to Allah alone to him we turn both in repentance and for forgiveness uh, truly he whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides none can mislead and he whom Allah leaves to go astray there is none who can guide and I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship save Allah alone <coughs> now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is both his servant and his messenger Alhamdulillah I'm far away from you so when I cough nobody has to worry about <coughs> COVID or anything like that uh, there's a good amount of distance uh, between us <coughs> uh, today's topic obviously is a very powerful one and one that I was thinking about how to approach it for a couple of days now just thinking about this really broad topic and this really important topic and how do we go about thinking about it when we talk about how do we hold on to our Islam how do we hold on to our Iman what are the things that tend to pull people away from their religious beliefs what are the things that tend to cause people to be diverted away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, there's a couple of things I really want to focus in on that the scholars mention when they talk about uh, this topic, when they talk about what is it that causes people to, you know, go away from the right path. Uh, and they mention a couple of things. One thing they mention is a shahawat and the other one is a shubuhat. Shahawat is translated as, you know, your passions, your desires, your lusts. And shubuhat is, is uh, you know, misconceptions, misunderstandings. And so people lose their Islam typically through one of these two doors, right? One door is you are drawn towards something because of a, a lust or a passion that drives you towards it. So somebody is driven towards, let's say, committing zina because they think, you know, they have this lust towards it and they think it's, you know, delightful and it's pleasurable and things like that. Somebody's drawn towards, for instance, selling drugs because they think it's going to make them wealthy and it's going to make them powerful and it makes them feel a certain way. So there's like these evil things that we feel a passion towards going towards sometimes, right? And shaitan, you know, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the words of Iblis, the words of shaitan, where he says, he says, I will make beautiful for them everything that's on earth, right? So shaitan is promising that he's going to make the evil things on earth beautiful. Shaitan is saying, you know, I'm not going to let them see the evils of zina. I'm going to make it look delightful and pleasurable. I'm not going to let them see the evils of consuming drugs. I'm going to make it seem like it's really cool and laid back and, and uh, you know, mystical. Uh, I'm not going to make them see the evils of stealing money. I'm going to make them feel like it's, you know, powerful and, and enriching. I'm not going to make them see the evils of backbiting and gossip. I'm going to make it feel, you know, exciting and popular. So Shaitan, his mission statement, which is in the Quran, is him saying that I will make the things on earth beautiful for them. I'm going to make this world beautiful for them, the evils of this world beautiful. And I will misguide all of them. So we know that this is the trick of shaitan. This is the work of shaitan to make this dunya seem really attractive to us. And people get drawn into it for different reasons, right? And, you know, this is one of the problems that draws people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fall into this life of evil. But you know, really when I think about it, when people fall into a life of committing haram, and I'm not saying like you commit haram once, we're talking about people where it becomes part of their lifestyle, right? Part of their lifestyle becomes they're committing haram. So part of their lifestyle is them, you know, for instance, um, committing zina. Or part of, part of their lifestyle is them selling drugs. Or part of their lifestyle is them, you know, being in a gang and killing people and committing murder or part of their lifestyle is stealing from others and finding scams and things like this. And, uh, you know, being just dishonest. So it becomes part of like the, the person you are, the, the persona that you have, right. The, the way that you live your life, it's a day in day out kind of thing because everybody makes mistakes here and there. But we're talking about when it's like part of your life that you're committing a type of haram. And so what happens to this kind of person? I think about it and I think about people I know in my life and people who I've met over the years and people I went to university with. You know, what happened to people who really went down that road, right? What happened to them? And I think two things tend to happen. 
One of them is the person gets disgusted by the sin eventually. Because let's be honest, sins are disgusting. They are, right? Shaitan makes them seem like they're really beautiful and enticing and attractive at a certain time. But eventually people realize it's, it's not worth it. Right? So somebody who's, you know, their lifestyle is committing, you know, for instance, uh, zina, that person at one point starts to think to themselves and, and they're thinking, you know, what am I doing with my life? Like every time I commit zina and I enter into a haram relationship with someone, I'm giving out, I'm giving up a part of myself, right? I'm giving up a part of me to someone else. And I'm not really getting much back because there's no real commitment. And, you know, these relationships are just frayed and they're exhausting me and they're taking away from me physically and they're taking away from me emotionally. And every time I go through a relationship and a haram relationship like this, I lose a part of myself. I lose part of my, you know, compassion. I lose a part of, you know, they, they feel like it's draining them because haram does drain you, right? Haram does take away from you in the end of the day, right? It seems attractive, but in the end it takes from you. It exacts from you. And so that person at some point is like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I just want to get married and I want to like have a halal life. I don't want to do this anymore. Right. And some people like, for instance, if they're in the life of selling drugs, you know, at some point they're thinking to themselves, am I a good person? Like I'm giving drugs to people. I'm ruining these people's lives. I could see their body is decaying. Their money is, is they're losing all their money buying drugs. And I'm give, facilitating for them the ruining of their life. Am I a good person if I'm doing this? And so nobody wants to feel like that, right? Everybody wants to go to sleep feeling like, you know, I'm doing my best. I'm trying my best. And so that person feels disgusted with this sin. And then they decide, you know, what? I just don't want to be part of this anymore. I'm, I'm leaving this, this whole thing. And so this is what happens to a lot of people. They commit haram and they get to a point where they're like, I, I can't do this anymore. And Allah Azza wa helps them hopefully, you know, find their path towards tawbah, towards repentance, towards getting back to Allah Azza wa But some type of people, they commit haram. And there's this cognitive dissonance, right? Because we want to feel to ourselves like we're good people. So then he says, well, you know, am I really doing something wrong when I sell drugs? Am I really doing something wrong? These people enjoy drugs. They enjoy having it. I'm facilitating something that's making their life more enjoyable, right? So now he starts to convince himself that the evil thing he's doing is actually a good thing, right? And the people, the people start to do this. They start to convince themselves these evil things, these haram things we're doing, are actually good things. And now you've migrated from shahawat, from desires and lusts and, and the passion to commit haram, to now you're changing your religion in order to justify what you're doing. You are now developing misconceptions and doubts about Islam because you're changing Islam to fit into the fact that you have created this haram lifestyle, right? And, uh, you know, that's that's something really dangerous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what of the one who the evil actions of his are beautiful. So he thinks that they are good. Like his evil actions, he starts to, they start to become beautified in his eyes, right? It's been beautified for him. So he thinks it's actually a good thing. You know, it's a good thing that I'm committing zina. It's a good thing that I'm committing murder. It's a good thing that I'm stealing money or embezzling. It's a good thing that I'm, you know, doing this or doing that. So this is, you know, one of the tricks of shaitan. And this is a dangerous one because he's getting you to change your religion, right? He's getting you to start to say, actually, drugs are not haram. I'm sure many of you have heard people make arguments like this, right? They're changing their religion. That's a really dangerous place to be. And that's when we start to enter into, you know, shubuhat, misconceptions, doubts about Islam. And these things, unfortunately, are common in our day and age, right? So many young people are, you know, um, talking about a lot of different misconceptions. And it happens sometimes because Islam is under attack. Let's be honest, right? From the moment that a lot of students walk into their schools, go to the university, even their teachers are, you know, subtly attacking, insulting Islam. There's a constant psychological, theological war that takes place from, you know, left-wing atheists to right-wing conservatives, you know, people who don't agree on anything, they agree on disliking Muslims, right, and disliking Islam. People go on YouTube and all they see is, you know, different videos attacking Islam and, and they don't know how to differentiate one thing from the other. And this is why it's so important for the Muslims to gain knowledge, right? It's so important for a Muslim to gain knowledge, especially at a young age. And we look at the Prophet 
you know, there's an interesting couple of hadith when you look at them side by side. One of them is some of the companions began to read from the books of other religions, like the Torah and things like this. And the Prophet Sallallahu saw them and he got upset with them. He saw Umar ibn Khattab reading from the Torah. He said, what are you doing? He said, if Musa, Lokana Musa Hayyan, if Musa was alive, he would be following this religion. He would, he would be following me, right? So the Prophet forbade them from reading these books. Then towards the end of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of the Sahaba are reading the books of you know, the Bible and the Torah and things like this. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to them, لا تصدقوا ولا تكذبوا That when you read the books of, of the people of the book, don't say that this is 100% true and don't say it's 100% false. Because some of it came from Allah and some of it changed over time. But why did the Prophet in the beginning stop Umar ibn Khattab from reading these books? And why did he at the end let the Sahaba read these books. And the scholars, they say it's because in the beginning, it's important for the Muslim to learn his faith, learn his religion, right? You know, you can't open yourself up to learn about misconceptions and doubts before you learn your deen. You need to establish your foundation. Then after that, you can start to learn about the misconceptions and doubts and be able to respond to them. And this is something really important for us to think about. And so the most important thing for you to take from this lecture and this talk that we have in whatever time we have left is for you to increase your knowledge. You have to strive to increase your knowledge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the time we have remaining, I want to answer some of the common questions that come up in relation to the misconceptions and doubts that a lot of young Muslims tend to have, right? Some of the common questions that come up and, and obviously some of these questions by themselves, I can we can give an entire lecture on them. But, you know, just to give you an idea of a response from an Islamic perspective so that you understand that there are deeper responses as well out there for you to know and that you can equip yourself inshallah with greater knowledge. So one common question is, you know, why should I believe in God, right? Like, Why should I believe in God? And uh, what's the evidences or the proof of God? Uh, by the way, I work for an organization, the Yaqeen Institute. There's a great paper and there's also a video as well based on the paper called The Case for Allah's Existence by Justin Perot. And I encourage you to go and check that out, inshallah. So why should we believe in Allah? Right? Why, why should we believe in God? And the answer to this really simply is that there is the fact that there is a creation is an evidence that there is a creator. Right? Because cause and effect exists. This is a metaphysical principle by which we base all our knowledge on, right? Uh, if you were to walk by a beach, for example, and you see that there's an arrangement of stones in a certain way, you would have to understand someone arranged these stones in the way that they are. They didn't just magically appear there, right? If you walk by a beach and it's, you know, the stones are writing out, I love you, or the stones are writing out help, right? You would know somebody arranged them in this order, in this way. Right? If you go home and you enter your house and all the furniture is rearranged, are you going to say, you know, it rearranged itself or are you going to say someone must have rearranged it? You understand that it's not random because there's something called cause and effect, right? If there's an effect, there must have been a cause for it. And we live our lives, even we base our, our science and our knowledge on the very basic basis of these types of principles, the principle that, you know, every cause has an effect. And so the fact that there is a creation is an evidence that there is a creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us in the Quran, Am min ghayri shay, am humul khaliqun. Did they create themselves or did nothing create them? Both options are logical, right? The fact that you came out of nothing, there was nothing, and then you know you were created, or that you know, you somehow created yourself even though you didn't exist, but you brought yourself into existence, that doesn't make any sense. Right? So both options are logical. There must be a creator outside of us who created us and began the chain of cause and effect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions to us, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبَعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقَ مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوَتْ فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرْ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورٍ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the one who created the seven heavens, one above the other. And then He said, You will not see any imperfection in the creation of the most compassionate. الْبَصَرِ So look again, do you see any flaws? الْبَصَرِ Then look again, كَرَّتَيْنِ And again, and your eyes will return frustrated and you will be weary. You will not find the imperfections 
in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the harmony of the creation of Allah. How biology and chemistry and physics, how, how Allah Azza has created things that fit so perfectly together. Look at how this earth lies in a place that is a zone that is habitable for life that is incredibly small. If this earth had been, this world had been just a little bit closer to the sun, we would have all burned. A little bit further from the sun, we would have all, it would have been too cold to carry light. Look at how Jupiter acts like a shield that a gravitational pull that pulls asteroids and meteors away from destroying this earth. Otherwise the earth would be destroyed and there would be no life. Without the electromagnetic force, there would be no life. Without gravity, there would be no life. Without a strong nuclear force, there would be no life. Allah tells you, look again, look again and again. Your eyes will return back to you frustrated that you have not found this imperfection in the creation of Allah Azza One physicist and philosopher, Robert Collins, he said, if the initial explosion of the Big Bang had differed in strength as little of, as one part in 10 to the power of 60, think about how big a number 10 to the power of 60 is. Like that's an incredibly large number. He said, if it just one part of it was different, a little bit more or a little bit less, just one part, he said the universe would have either quickly collapsed back on itself or it would have expanded too rapidly for stars to form. In either case, life would be impossible. The chance of this happening is like firing a bullet at a one inch target 20 billion light years away. Imagine shooting a gun, shooting a bullet at a target that is 20 billion light years away and the target is only one inch and you hit the mark. How improbable is that? It's impossible. This is an impossibility. And so the fine-tuning and the perfection of the creation of Allah Azza is also an evidence of the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's also implications of rejecting Allah, right? When you reject Allah and you reject the fact that a Creator created you and put you here for a reason, you lose the purpose of your life. It's impossible to have a meaningful purpose of your life if at the core you believe you're here randomly and for no reason, right? And we lose more than that. We lose hope, right? How can you hope for a better tomorrow when you don't believe that there's anything beyond what is already in existence, right? How do you move past <clears throat> the losses of the past? How do you have hope for a greater future if all of this world is what it is and it will end the way that it is currently? <clears throat> <clears throat> this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, very beautiful verse. <inaudible> that indeed nobody despairs from the relief of Allah except the people who disbelieve. Right? This is a function of rejection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rejection of your creator, is that you lose hope. Right? So Allah says only those who have rejected Allah are the ones who have lost all hope in the relief of Allah Azza We also lose, you know, the conception of justice. We will think ultimately that nobody's going to be held accountable, ultimately for, for the things that they've done in this world. That someone like Hitler, who killed all of these people and tortured them, and then he just commits suicide, that's it, he never answers for all of his sins. So you lose the conception of justice. And we lose happiness, right? Let me give you an example. Imagine you're sitting on a plane, okay? And on this plane, sorry, let me go back. Imagine you wake up on a plane, like you're walking, you're living your life, everything's going fine, and all of a sudden, you knocked out, you wake up, you find yourself sitting on a plane. But this plane is awesome. Like this plane, you're in first class, it's a private jet, and you look outside the window, and there's beautiful views of, you know, mountains and oceans, and it just looks incredible. And you look around, this, this plane that you're on, and there are celebrities that you love, whatever celebrities you like, if you like basketball, it's LeBron James, if you love, you know, whatever, whatever celebrity you happen to want to meet in your life, they happen to be on this plane. You're like, wow, this is so cool. And then the stewardess comes and she brings you your favorite food, whatever it is, sushi or steak, or, you know, the most expensive food that you love the most, and it's so delicious, and she brings it to you. And let me ask you a question. On this plane, <clears throat> where you have these beautiful views and beautiful company and, and, and the best food, will you feel happiness 
If you don't know why you're on the plane, who put you on the plane, and where the plane is going, would you feel happiness? And the answer is no. You may be distracted for a little bit. You may get a little distracted by the food and by the company. You may get a little bit distracted, sure, but you're not going to feel happy because you have no idea who put you on that plane. And that's a metaphor for this dunya. You're never going to achieve happiness if you don't understand who put you in this dunya and for what reason. You may be distracted by the dunya. The dunya may give you a lot of distractions, right? But you're never going to feel happy and contentment unless you know who put you in this world and for what reason they did. And for this reason, you know, religion, belief in God will always be more enduring. You know, we're living in an age where godlessness is rising. Uh, and ultimately, you know, religion and spirituality is so important to the human psyche. And this is why, subhanAllah, today, like, even as we see, like, atheism is rising or godlessness is rising, what do we see happening alongside it? We see an opioid crisis. People are taking drugs and self-medicating themselves. Because when religion is taken away, what's left for a person to feel happiness and relief from? And, you know, you look at, for instance, the Soviet Union, which mandated practically atheism upon people and tried to ban and abolish religion, what happens in the end, right? As soon as the, the Soviet Union fell, after 90 years of doing this, people went back to their mosques and churches, right? Because this is the reality. People are from a deep place. We know that God exists. And the things that turn us away from that realization, that understanding that God exists, that clouds our fitra. Right, that clouds the fitra, that innate understanding that God exists, is sins and is misconceptions and as you know things that we have to remove from our lives. There's also the argument for morality. <clears throat> how do we know a good thing is good and how do we know a bad thing is bad? Right? How do we know a good thing is good? Right? Somebody tells you this is good and this is bad. How do we know that? Right? How do we objectively know good things are good and bad things are bad? On what basis do we ground our morality. How do we know that we should help the orphan and we know that that's a good thing, right? How do we know this? Because, and you see this because when you don't have an objective morality, what happens? Something that they said 10 years ago was uh, an evil thing, a sinful thing. Now they tell you it's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. And love is love. And this is this. And why is their conception of morality constantly changing? Because they haven't, you, you know, you understand what I mean? Like, how do we, because they haven't grounded it in something important. Our concept of morality, if we believe that taking care of the orphan is correct, is good. If we believe helping the weak is good. If we believe stealing and, and killing people is bad. On what basis did we come with that understanding? On what basis did we ground our objective morality? And there's another question. How, why do we even have mercy? Why do we have compassion? Mercy should not emerge from a Darwinian understanding. Why do, we, why do we be merciful to other people? Why are animals merciful to other animals? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mercy, right? And so ultimately it's self-evident. Ibn Taymiyyah says, كَيْفِ يُطْلَبَ الدَّلِيلُ وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ دَلِيلٍ بِإِنَّهُ هُوَ وَاحِدٍ Right? It's like how can somebody ask for, I probably butchered that, but how, how can somebody ask for evidence of Allah when everything is an evidence that he is one subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, don't they think about themselves, right? The fact that we exist, the fact that we are created and we have the attributes that we do, all of this is evidence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another common question that comes up is deism, where the person says, you know, I believe in God, right? So they escape this question of rejection of the belief in God. They say, I believe in God. I'm just not religious, right? Or yeah, I think God created us, but God doesn't want us to do anything, right? He just put us on earth. And so... They want to explain the Creator, but they do not want to abide or follow the Creator themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this question in the Qur'an, right, in many different ways. Uh, Allah says, did they think that we would create them aimlessly, that they would be left aimlessly? Right? Did you think that we were going to create you and, and give you life without telling you what to do with that life? Did you think we were going to create you and give you this world and this and this life and the people that you're going to interact with without telling you how to manage this life that you're in? We as human beings, we take care of the things that are in our possessions, right? We take care of our children. We take care of our families. We even take care of our cars and our televisions and our smartphones, right? 
Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not do the same? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of our physical needs. He gives us a world that has oxygen, that has water, that has food. How can Allah take care of our physical needs, but not take care of our spiritual needs? This claim is in fact an insult to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِ Very difficult to translate literally this phrase. But what it means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, they have disrespected Allah. Like they haven't properly honored Allah azza wa meaning they've disrespected Allah. Why? If قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَعَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ when they said that God did not reveal anything upon his servant. Meaning Allah created us, but he didn't give any revelation. Allah is saying this is an insult to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah created us, right? You're saying that Allah created us and then he neglected us? And then he didn't bother teaching us how to take care of our lives? They're saying that Allah is not merciful as well. Because it's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A merciful God, a caring God, a guiding God, the one who answers our dua. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the God that we believe in. For you to say that He created us and just left us by ourselves, you're saying that He's not merciful and He's not caring and He's not guiding and He doesn't hear our dua. And this is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather Allah Azza wa gave us, you know, direction in our lives. They may ask, or they may say, I believe in God, but how do I know it's the God of my parents, the God that my parents believe? You may go to a philosophy class in the university and in the first class they'll say, you know, you're Muslim because your parents are Muslim. And you're Jewish because your parents are Jewish and you're Christian because your your parents are Christian, right? So how do we respond to this type of misconception or this type of argument? The answer, the quick answer anyways, is that you know our theology, our belief, our rationality uh, of Islam is in its core creed. Our God is not multiple. Our God is not carved into an idol or worshipped. Our God did not take human form and eat and go to the washroom. We have the purest monotheistic religion, which makes rational sense. It makes complete rational sense to believe in a single God, a monotheistic religion, and it connects with our fitrah at a rational and at an emotional level. And so, you know, left alone from society, if somebody for some reason was born in the middle of the desert, born in the middle of the Amazon, and they had no connection with, with the rest of the world, this person can still arrive at the acknowledgement, the conclusion that there must be a God and that God must be one. The basic core tenets of Islam a person can arrive at just by connecting to their fitrah and using their intelligence. But no one left alone is going to derive a trinity, right? Nobody left alone is going to derive the complexity of a polytheistic religion of multiple gods, the god of this and the god of that. No, no, no. Nobody's going to come up with these very specific complex theologies. But the base theology of Islam that there's one god that he created us and that he's deserving of praise. This anybody, even if they were never connected to the rest of civilization, never heard of any religion, can still come up with this uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then there's the miracles of the Qur'an and its recitation, just hearing the Qur'an and its meanings and its preservation. All of these are evidences of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The life of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his seerah, that even his enemies cannot deny his nobility. They cannot deny his sincerity. They cannot deny his morality. They cannot deny his knowledge. This in and of itself is nothing short uh, of a miracle. Another question that a lot of young people like to ask is, you know, why is Islam so restrictive, right? Why is Islam so restrictive? All of my friends can do this and all of my friends can do that. And, you know, why is it that I have to be different than everyone else? And, you know, I, I sympathize with young people who feel this. Uh, I think any of us who grew up, particularly in the West, we, we found, probably everywhere, to be honest, the world is a small village now. And we feel a little bit of this, right? Like, why do I have to be different than everyone else? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ That most of the people, even if you strive for it, will not believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you were to obey most of those who are on earth, they would mislead you from the ways of Allah. They only follow assumptions and they are only uh, falsifying. And so Islam does tell us to be different than everyone else. It says, أكثر, most of those who are on earth are going to be misleading you away, away from Allah. And most of the people are not going to be believers. And so Islam is telling you to be different than everyone else. Yes, you're saying, why is Islam telling me to be different? I agree, Islam is telling us to be different. It doesn't mean that most people on earth um, 
or it does mean that most people on earth will be in a different direction than us. It does mean that you're going to be a stranger in this world. It does mean that you're going to be foreign and different than everyone else. Why? Because most people are not striving for higher goals. Most people are not looking for spiritual enlightenment and connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most people want to follow their base desires. They want to be hedonistic. They want to amuse themselves. They want to immerse themselves in everything that, that pleases them, that gives them pleasure. This is what most people want to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you think that most of them hear or reason? Rather, they are like cattle. Rather, they are even more astray in their way. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants success for you. He wants spiritual success for you. He wants you to arrive at a place with where you have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? A place that most other people don't even bother to reach. And in order to achieve this, you have to be different. Think of it like this. <clears throat> if you want to be successful in the dunya, <clears throat> Are you going to do what everyone else does and get a nine to five job? And, or if you want to be really successful, if you want to be Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, don't you have to do something different? Don't you have to, you know, approach your life different? Don't you have to do something different than what most other people are doing in order to become successful? If you want to be a successful athlete, don't you, do you think that they live their lives like everyone else? Do you think these people who play at the highest level of, of, of sports, that they're living their life like everyone else? No, they spend thousands of hours training. They're exercising while their friends are hanging out and watching Netflix and eating junk food. They're exercising. They're eating very specific regimens, right? Why? Because in order to be successful, they have to be different than the trend. They have to dedicate themselves to improving themselves, <clears throat> right? They couldn't be average. They have to be different than the rest of the sheep, right? And spiritual success is no different. Learn it, leading, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to lead. You need to show integrity and you need to show discipline. And so Islam sometimes puts some rules on us, right? And, but, you know, we should also turn this question on its head. Instead of asking why is Islam so restrictive, you know, ask yourself why is the rest of society so permissive? We know that things like alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana are very, very damaging to people, right? Why is society so permissive about these things? We have to wear our seatbelt when we get in the car. Way more people die from alcohol and smoking and even marijuana than they die from car accidents, right? And the impact of those evils are, are far more reaching. But our deen protects us. This is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's for our own good. And the one who created us knows what's best for us, right? And ultimately, whoever abandons something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give them that which is far greater. Because Allah azza wa jal, you know, permits what is tayyib, what is pure, what is good, and he prevents the khaba'if, that which is filthy and impure and harmful. And our trust ultimately relies with Allah Azza wa and not with what the people think is right, but what, with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks is correct. Um, so, you know, ultimately this is, you know, these are some questions that I wanted to answer, but I'll say, you know, one thing for the elders who may be in, in the crowd, I think the youth in our community need you to be welcoming. The youth in our community, they need you to be understanding to them. Um, and that's something that, that's really important for us to think about. Um, uh, you know, one example I can give you is when the young man came to the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, he said to the Prophet, I want to commit zina. Give me permission to commit zina. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, if, if he was acting like many of the elders in our community today, what would you do if a young man comes and says, give me permission to commit zina? You know, smack the kid. How dare you say something like this? Oh, the billah, you're like, you've become a shaitan or something like that. No, the Prophet doesn't do this. The Prophet wasallam. what does he do? He speaks to him on an intellectual level. He tells him, would you like someone to do this action with your sister? The man says, no. He says, well, other people don't like it to be done to their sister. Would you like this act to be done to your aunt, to your mother, to etc., etc.? The man says, no. The Prophet says, likewise, others do not want this to be done to their relatives as well. Then the young man, then the Prophet ﷺ puts his hand on the heart of the young man, on the chest of the young man. And he makes dua. And he says, Allahumma ghfir dhamda, wa tahir qalba, wa hasin farja. Oh Allah, forgive his sins 
and purify his heart and uh, protect his private parts from haram. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ makes this dua. The young man stands up and he leaves and he says, when I came to the Prophet, there was nothing I desired more than that sin. And when I left the Prophet, there was nothing I detested or hated more, felt more revulsion than that sin. How did the Prophet turn him around? One, he answered his question on an intellectual level. He answered his question, the shubuhat, the misconceptions this young man had, the Prophet answered them. He gave them responses. He gave him a parable. He gave him something that would allow him to intellectually understand why he shouldn't be doing this evil action. And the second thing that he gives him is he emotional, emotionally connects with the young man. Because the Prophet could have been like, you don't want this to be done to your sister, right? Okay, there, I gave you an answer. Now leave. No, the Prophet doesn't do that. The Prophet tells him what? He puts his hand on his chest. Now, why does he put his hand on his chest? We know the Prophet ﷺ, when he would usually make dua, he would hold his hands up like this. And if he was very desperate to make dua, he would hold his hands all the way up to the air, that you would see the whiteness underneath his arms, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And sometimes when the Prophet would make dua, he would hold his finger like this, up and he would make dua. But in this circumstance, the Prophet didn't do any of those three. He put his hand on the chest of the young man. Now, why would you do that? Because he's building an emotional connection to that young man. He's letting that young man know that he loves him and he cares for him. And he makes dua for him. And when he builds that emotional connection with that young man, now he has been engaged intellectually and engaged emotionally. So the young man gets up and that sin that he wanted to do now becomes the most evil and ugly thing in his eyes. SubhanAllah. And this is the type of tarbiyah that we need to give our children, we need to give the youth of our community, that when they are going down the wrong path, it can't be just yelling at them and telling, how dare you do this, a'udhu billah, you are shayateen. No, we have to have a certain level of compassion, of love for them, of wanting to engage them intellectually, answering their questions when they have questions, and also engaging with them emotionally in order to bring them into our community, bring them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ensure that they stay on the right path. And finally, I'll say one thing. All of us are worried because, you know, subhanAllah, sometimes you see people who are doing well in their Islam, they were, get, you know, getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then something happens and they go down the wrong path. Something happens, they enter into the world of sins, and then they justify their sins, and then they, you know, leave the religion, change the religion, whatever it might be. <clears throat> How do we protect ourselves? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Badiru bil a'mal salih qabla yatiyakum. Uh, he said, haste to do good deeds before there comes to you trials, fitna, that will be like pieces of the darkness of the night. SubhanAllah, what is you know, the darkness of the night? Imagine the night, it's pitch black, there's no moon, there's no stars, you can't see anything, you don't know, you don't know where to go, right? He says, in this fitna, what will, what will happen? That a man will wake up as a believer and will go to sleep as a disbeliever. Or they will wake up as a disbeliever and they will go to sleep as a believer. So people's iman is fluctuating, you know, significantly. A person wakes up a believer, a mu'min, not a Muslim, a mu'min, a believer, and they go to sleep and they've already lost their Islam completely. So how does how do we protect ourselves from that? Well, the Prophet told you in the beginning what to do of the hadith. He told you, Badiru bil amal salih. Be hasty in doing good deeds. Allah gave you iman today. He gave you faith today. You believe in Allah today. Don't take it for granted that you will have Iman tomorrow. And by protecting your Iman, by doing good deeds today, you will protect your Iman tomorrow. By doing good deeds today, you are protecting your faith tomorrow. And so haste to do good deeds. Don't put it off. Don't procrastinate. Say, I'm going to do good deeds today. I'm going to do my prayers today. I'm going to give charity today. I'm going to do something good, kind and good today so that I can gain reward from Allah and so Jal. But it's protecting my iman and protecting me from evil and ensuring that I don't go down the wrong road and ensuring that I still have belief in Allah and so Jal that is pure. So that on the day of judgment, even if I've committed sins, I say, well, I believed in you alone and I worshipped you alone. And I didn't change your religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives our sins and enters us into paradise. May Allah azza wa jal give us that good ending to our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who remain on the right path. May Allah azza wa jal make us of those who are calling uh, with the good word for people to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come back to his religion. Ameen.
Uh, I'm sorry. I, <clears throat> I think. Apologies, um, technical difficulties. Um, so yes, uh, firstly, Jazakallah khairan for your talk. And uh, inshallah, I'll be sending some questions your way if that's all right to continue the discussion a bit. Um, so firstly, uh, we had someone ask, what practical steps can Muslims take in the West to hold on to their faith based off of the discussion that you just gave? Jazakallah <clears throat> khair. So the practical steps I'll give you, number one <clears throat> is to increase your knowledge increase your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, again, you know, I work for Yaqeen Institute and you go to yaqeeninstitute.org, there's a lot of great materials on a number of different topics, especially topics where, you know, people have doubts in that we produce in order for you to have answers at your disposal. But you should be educating yourself, increasing your knowledge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, increasing your knowledge of this religion. The more knowledge you gain, the more it will act as an inoculation against a lot of the doubts that people bring about Islam will help you preserve your understanding about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about this deen. So that's number one, is to gain knowledge. The number two point, like I mentioned earlier, is to do good deeds, right? You can have Iman, but if you take your Iman for granted and you just sleep on it, then, you know, fitna will come, right? Tests will come, trials will come, right? And when those trials come, you know, they can really harm our, our Iman. And so the way to protect our Iman is to do good deeds and do them as quickly as we can. Right. Uh, another thing to think about, you know, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, um, He said that shaitan will come to any of you and will say to you, who created this and who created that? Then he will say to you, who created Allah? Right. So the shaitan will come to a person and say, you know, who created the earth? Who created the mountains? Who created the sky? And you'll say, Allah created them. Then he'll say to you, who created Allah? Right, and subhanAllah, this is an argument that atheists still use till today, right? Who created the creator? And they think it's a smart argument. But what's interesting about this hadith is the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِذَا بَلَغَ ذَلِكْ فَلْيَسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ If it reaches this point, let them seek forgive, let them seek uh, refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Seek the refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal. Why is that interesting? There is an intellectual response to that question, right? If somebody says, who created the creator? There's a very strong intellectual response to this question. Uh, and the Qur'an alludes to it in different places. The Prophet and the Sunnah allude to it in different places. Uh, you know, the concept of infinite regression is illogical. Like, let me give you an example. Imagine a series of dominoes, right? A series of dominoes. You guys know dominoes, right? One of them knocks down the other. So imagine a series of dominoes. This domino can only be knocked over when, when the one before it hits it. And the one before it uh, and that one can only knock over when the one before that hits it, right? Now imagine this line of dominoes goes on forever. Infinity. It, it, there is an infinite number of dominoes. Will these dominoes ever be knocked down? We will say no. There has to be a first domino, and that first domino has to begin the chain of reaction, right? Uh, another example I like to give sometimes is like, let's say I have a gun, and I'm pointing at one of you, <laughs> okay? But I can only shoot this gun. Let's say it's a water gun. I'm not, I'm not going to kill anybody. Okay, it's a water gun. I can only <clears throat> shoot my water gun when I have like permission to do so. And my permission is when the person behind me shoots their water gun at me. You understand? And that person only has permission to shoot their water gun at me when the person behind them shoots their water gun at them. And this chain goes on for infinity. Would anybody shoot me with my water gun? Would I ever shoot my water gun? The answer is no, because it goes on for infinity. You understand what I mean? This is called infinite regression. The fact that I exist is evidence that there has to be what they call in philosophical terms a prime mover, a first cause. In Islam, we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is Al Awwal, the first. So there has to be a first for us to exist. The fact that we exist means that there must be a first. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created the chain of cause and effect that brought us into existence, right? So this is maybe a philosophical answer, but it's a very strong response. But the Prophet doesn't even give us this response. He doesn't even bother with it. What does he say instead? He says, seek refuge in Allah. Because sometimes our sins cause us to turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The sins causes to, now the doubts that yesterday you're like, this is such a silly argument. Of course, there's a loss subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, rejecting, you know, the fact that there's a creator is such, it's such a, you know, nonsensical type of approach. 
Today you think that, but when you commit sins, they weaken you. And you start to say, well, maybe these arguments make sense. It's almost not an intellectual issue. It's almost an issue of the heart, right? It's almost an issue of, I don't want to admit that I'm committing sins. So I would rather find a way to, you know, say that I'm not committing sins and it's the religion that's wrong. And so protecting yourself from sins is incredibly important. Seeking the refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these things are incredibly important and will help preserve you from a lot of sins. Uh, finally, to be engaged in a community, suhbah salihah, having righteous companionship, good friends who are all trying to strive to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look for people who you can spend time with, who are trying to better themselves in the sight of Allah azza wa jalla, and spend more time with them. Spend more time. Look at your life. Who in your life is helping you get closer to Allah? <clears throat> and who in your life is drawing you further away from Allah? And spend more time with those who are bringing you closer to Allah azza wa jalla. And seek, look for people who are even closer to Allah and spend time with them. These are really important things that will help you uh, preserve your Islam, preserve your Iman away from a lot of the fitness that we are seeing in today's day and age. Amazing, thank you. Um, and that was really interesting. I appreciate that you changed like example to like a water gun because I was getting a little concerned there. But um, khair. Um, so moving on from that question, this is actually regarding your work at Yakin and um, a bit more to do with like the youth environment. So um, I'm really lucky in auto that I get to volunteer with the Muslim Student Association. And I know your work with Yakin touches a lot of youth communities as well. Um, one question that I have is that how do you how do you um, see the role of organizations in the community in ensuring that youth are able to get engaged with Islamic studies and that also that um, like young Muslims are able to have conversations about Islam with their peers, like their, their Muslim brothers and sisters that might be falling off the deen, but also their non-Muslim community around them? Uh, so, you know, I think it's incredibly important for our organizations right now to empower the youth. A lot of the things that we do at Yaqeen, for instance, we have conviction circles, which um, provide us materials so that if you're running a halaqa, if you're doing something in your MSA, you can come together, here's some materials, here's some questions you can ask to facilitate discussion, to have information about, you know, why we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, proofs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you can develop, you know, these have these conversations in a way that you can, you know, strengthen your iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know what, something that's interesting that I think also really pa is powerful, um, particularly with the youth, is I think like people have to understand that we as Muslims, we have obligations. And part of that obligation is to give da'wah, right? When you realize that part of your obligation is to share your religion with non-Muslims, what does that do? That makes you feel a sense of responsibility. That makes you feel responsible to learn your religion. That makes you feel responsible to be a good example for your religion. That makes you feel responsible to go to others, to teach them, to tell them about Islam. And so da'wah as a function, you know, of course, we're, we're, we're sharing this beautiful religion with others. We're letting other people know about the religion. But it also has an effect of making us more firm in our own deen because it causes us to learn our own religion. And so I think, you know, one of the, the issues that I, I feel arise in the community these days is that, uh, you know, people don't want to give da'wah too much anymore. Maybe they're worried about Islamophobia or this or that. So we don't really want to, you know, talk about our religion too much and tell people to follow this religion and that it's a beautiful religion and it's the correct religion. We don't want to have these conversations too much because we're worried about Islamophobia or how we're going to be seen. And I don't think that's healthy for our iman, right? Because when we understand that we have a mission, we have an obligation, you know, to convey the message of Islam, that that, that gives us the feeling that we are responsible and that we have to learn our religion deeper and that we have to do a better job of embodying the principles of our religion as well. Uh, and so that's something that I would encourage different Muslim organizations is to revive the responsibility of da'wah in the hearts of the youth because that will help them save their iman as well. Not only will it, inshallah, allow other people to become Muslim and allow us to fulfill our responsibilities in front of Allah, but it will allow the youth in your own community to be more firm in their Islam.